Good evening, I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. My professionals, David Drucker of the Washington Examiner and John Fund of the National Review Online, join us. This evening, it is the beginning of the second half of the year. We're past July 4th, and we're looking at the presidency and the Congress as they lunge towards the election. And everything that is said, done, acted upon, all of the imprecations, the threats, the anxiety, even the sobbing. It's all about getting reelected or getting elected the first time these next months. So I begin with what looks to be a straightforward political gambit by the Speaker of the House, John Boehner, the highest elected Republican official in the, in the land. This is about a lawsuit against the president. I learned from Mr. Drucker, writing at the Washington Examiner, that the speaker and his counselors have been consulting on this with the House Judiciary Committee and scholars for many months before this suit moves. David, a very good evening to you. A lawsuit against the president, uh, president of the United States. Is there precedent for this, and to what end? Good evening to you, David. Good evening, John, and... You know, one branch of government suing the other is not unheard of. It's not easy. It's not common. You have to do it in a way that's going to give you legal standing. And that's why the Speaker in January began preparing for this, because they wanted to develop a lawsuit in a way, and we still don't know entirely how it's going to, what it's going to look like once it's presented. Uh, but they wanted to develop a lawsuit in a way that they could try and guarantee guarantee themselves both standing and a chance of being successful on the merits. And so, you know, look, I, I never try and remove politics from anything here because politics is a part of everything. But it isn't a decision that the Speaker made in June uh, because he thought it would be a good idea uh, you know, four months hence. Um, whatever he thinks about the idea politically, it's a decision he made in January. But this really, in my mind, you go back to last July when the president started making unilateral changes to the Affordable Care Act that Republicans uh, just feel go against uh, the letter of the law as it was passed. So, therefore, the trigger for this was the will of the wisp attitude of the Obama administration towards the Affordable Care Act. We're going to enforce it unless we aren't going to enforce it. I understand from your article, David, this also involves the EPA and the decisions. Is this about executive action, that there's no rhyme or reason to it? Is that the frustration? Well, I think the frustration is that the executive action that the president has taken, the view of, of congressional Republicans, is just so... Uh, over the top and, and flip it, if you will. In other words, we're going to do what we want because we can and you can't stop us without even a hint um, of trying to stick to the letter, to, to the law as it is written. And, and, you know, whatever one will say about John Boehner, um, he is an institutionalist at heart and he believes in the legislative branch in the House of Representatives. It doesn't I mean he's beyond reproach and there's plenty to criticize, but he is protective of the legislative branch. I think he's been looking for a way to do something that wouldn't also jeopardize Republicans' chances in election. We already know that they tried to use the power of the purse to affect the Affordable Care Act and resulted in a government shutdown. That was nothing but a disaster that could have cost Republicans the House majority um, and any chance at the Senate. And Boehner's not going to do that just because He's protective of the legislative branch. So I think he feels like this is a good uh, way to walk the line and, and send a message, possibly get something done on policy, but not do something stupid politically. Mr. Fund, a very good evening to you. You have a thoughtful piece at the National Review Online, 50 years after the Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I think it was 645 in the evening at the White House when he signed it that evening. Gathered around him were all of the sponsors and the supporters of the Civil Rights Act. And here we are 15 year, 50 years later to measure. And I find the irony in your piece that Senator Hubert Humphrey promised that he would eat the Civil Rights Act, eat the paper, if it ever came to favoritism or using racial quotas and reverse discrimination. And yet, John, isn't that routinely the arguments before the Supreme Court and routinely the arguments in states? Good evening to you, John. A pleasure. John, the moral power that Martin Luther King and the people who brought the Brown versus Board of Education 
lawsuit had was they wanted to go back to the Constitution and say, this is the time we need to redeem our Constitution's claims of equality before the law. That's all we seek. We don't seek special favoritism. We seek equality. We seek justice. And that carried the day. 80% of Republicans in Congress, 66% of Democrats in Congress voted for the Civil Rights Act. Sadly, almost immediately, parts of that civil rights coalition that built it betrayed it because they immediately went to a racial spoil system. They said, you know, the conditions that we find in some places are so bad, we have to have a fist on the scale of justice. We have to have a um, major ameliorative measures that may someday go away, but for now we need them. Sadly, that has brought more racial tension, more racial resentment, and frankly has been unfair because a lot of minority students who have been pushed into schools that they're not quite ready for when they might have been perfectly ready for a different school have ended up ending their college careers without graduating or having seeing their dreams of a professional career dashed because there was a mismatch between their academic preparation and the school they were uh, basically put into because of affirmative action. There's a quote in your piece, John, and I pick it out just because Mrs. Clinton is much in the news on her book tour and as a potential political uh, political candidate in 2016, uh, commenting on the Civil Rights Act at the 40th anniversary. This is in 2003 when she was a junior senator from New York. If we don't take race as part of our character, then we are kidding ourselves. What does Mrs. Clinton mean by that? It means we're saturated, marinated in race, and you can't separate out in constitutional law, uh, the race question. Well, that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says we need to treat all people equally before the law. It doesn't mean all people will treat all people equally at all times. We still have prejudice. We still have favoritism. But before the law, we must seek and aim for colorblindness. Gentlemen, let's go to the border. Uh, later on this evening, I'll report on some shocking numbers from the Rio Grande Valley. This is the part of the Border Patrol that's along the Gulf of Mexico near Brownsville, McAllen, Texas. They're overwhelmed, and that is now the choice crossing for the families and minors coming from Central America, tens of thousands of them. They're expecting 35,000 per month all the way till October. 35,000. They're overwhelmed. And they're, they're crossing in batches of 200 or 100 people at a time heading right for a Border Patrol guard because they want to be contained by the Border Patrol, put into facilities, transferred, and then released to their parents or into America. So the question is not what is to be done, not what can Congress do, but your perception, David. Is the Obama administration overwhelmed by this? Uh, is there any reason to believe they expected this, David? I don't think there's a reason to believe that really anybody expected this, including the administration, but I think that it's often in, in times of crisis or, or major problems, whether, you know, we're talking the Gulf oil spill of a few years back, um, the, the crisis in Iraq now, um, or other problems, they just tend to move slowly and deliberately, and it, it's either cautiously, if you're thinking positive about their their inaction, or... Um, they simply don't know how to handle a crisis. Um, they don't know how to move quickly to handle a crisis. So this is following a pattern for the administration. They may yet figure out what to do and how they want to handle it, but it, it'll probably take them a while. Mr. Fund, I believe the president will be in Texas three times this week for fundraiser, maybe twice, maybe just once, and three big checks. But in any event, according to the White House so far, he does not plan to go to the border. Does this make good politics, John? Isn't this what Rahm Emanuel taught us, now mayor of Chicago, that you should take advantage of a crisis? This certainly looks like one. When President Bush decided to fly over New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, he was attacked for being disconnected, heartless, yes. and not willing to see events on the ground. For the president to visit Texas and not to go to the border and not to support our Border Patrol and the other forces there and to learn what's happening and to meet with local officials is a form of dereliction of duty. John, it can't, been, it can't have been planned that the president would be going to Texas three times for fundraisers 
uh, while this crisis is overwhelming. I mean, there, there's a thousand people a day at the Rio Grande Valley. I'm sure there are other crossings, but this is the one that's overwhelmed. And the president's asked for money. The, the White House scheduler couldn't have known about this. These fundraisers are planned months in advance. But the point is, either the president should have pulled the plug on the fundraisers and sat down with members of Congress and made sure that something passed quickly, or he should go to the border. Keeping with his existing schedule is bizarre. John Fund of the National Review Online, David Drucker of the Washington Examiner. When we come back, there are other management problems in Washington. I'm John Batchelor.